Hello, my name is Tim Drake, and my topic today is on the long-awaited JNC-8 guidelines on the treatment of hypertension. I am a clinical pharmacist and also a professor of pharmacy practice, and the, my place of work is in an ambulatory care clinic where I work with family practice physicians in treating um, primary care disease states such as hypertension. Also, I teach hypertension at the College of Pharmacy here in Utah. And so I'm very excited that JNC 8 came out. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of a history on JNC 8, nicknamed JNC Late, just because it took so long to come out. So back in 2002, JNC 7 was released. But since 2002, there have been many developments in the field of hypertension, and also many medications that we use to treat hypertension have now become generic and we have gained about 10 to 12 years of experience in using those medications. So in 2008, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute invited members to join the JNC-8 panel. It was then thought that the guidelines would be released in 2010. However, there's been multiple delays. One of them is that in 2011, the Institute of Medicine released a guideline on guidelines named clinical practice guidelines we can trust. The panel decided to conform to these recommendations, and so there were further delays. Then in June of 2013, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute announced that it would no longer sponsor the development of guidelines. This is why the lipid guidelines that were just released a couple months ago were actually released from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology and not from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So in December 2013, the JNC-8 panel decided to release its findings independently of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute or any other sponsoring organization to avoid any further delays. So my objectives for you on this presentation is that I would hope that you'd be able to know the three overarching questions addressed by JNC-8. I also want you to know a few big differences between JNC-7 and JNC-8. Finally, I'd like you to be able to apply this information clinically to a patient, so you should be able to set appropriate blood pressure goals and prescribe appropriate treatment for patients with different disease states. So this slide shows the prevalence of hypertension over the last several years. The blue column is for 2009 to 2010, and the green column is for 2011 to 2012. Over the last decade or so, these numbers have significantly improved. Right now, about 80% of patients that have hypertension know that they have hypertension and have been clinically diagnosed. So this means about one out of every five people with high blood pressure doesn't really know that they have high blood pressure and therefore they can't be treated for it. But as you can see, most patients who do know that they have high blood pressure are being treated for that. However, we still only have about a 50% control rate. Since hypertension significantly contributes to heart and renal disease, imagine how many cases of heart failure, coronary artery disease, stroke, and kidney disease could be prevented if we were able to increase that control number to up around 70%. Or 80%. As pharmacy professionals, we are in a great position to screen for hypertension and recommend appropriate treatment. So I thought it'd be useful right now to review some of the key points of JNC7 so that we can compare and contrast the differences between JNC7 and JNC8. So JNC7 introduced the concept of prehypertension to let people know that they needed to start lifestyle changing. It also defines stage one and stage two hypertension. So stage one would be anywhere from 140 and 159 millimeters of mercury systolically and 90 to 99 diastolically. Stage two would be anything over 160 millimeters of mercury systolically or over 100 millimeters of mercury diastolically. GNC7 also set the gold blood pressure for all ages or the general population at less than 140 over 90 and it reduced the goal to less than 130 over 80 for those with diabetes 
or renal disease. It also introduced a list of disease states for which particular medications showed a benefit. This list of disease states is, was referred to as compelling indications. So for example, somebody with a history of a heart attack, we would want to use medications such as a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or an aldosterone antagonist because these have shown benefit as far as reducing the risk of having another heart attack, reducing the risk of death, or reducing the risk of hospitalizations. They also recommended the initial use of two drugs for stage two hypertension. And then they strongly recommended the use of a thiazide type diuretic as the initial agent to treat hypertension, largely due to the ALHAT trial. So now that we have a background with JNC7, I thought I'd introduce a case to kind of guide our thinking when we discuss JNC8. So JR is a 58-year-old white female with type 2 diabetes. She has normal renal function. Her blood pressure today is 144 over 86. It has averaged 146 over 88 over the last six visits. She has had difficulty getting to her goal of less than 130 over 80, and she now takes hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams daily, enalapril, 10 milligrams daily, and metoprolol, extended release, 50 milligrams daily. Her only complaint is that she gets fatigued rapidly when trying to exercise. So kind of keep this case in the back of your mind as we go over some of the recommendations from JNC8. So the three overarching questions, or what the panel wanted to answer for us, is that number one, in adults with hypertension, does initiating antihypertensive pharmacologic therapy at specific blood pressure thresholds improve health outcomes? And then number two, in adults with hypertension, does treatment with antihypertensive pharmacologic therapy to a specified blood pressure goal lead to improvements in health outcomes? And then number three, in adults with hypertension, do various antihypertensive drugs or drug classes differ in comparative benefits and harms on specific health outcomes. So really, at what point does initiating therapy actually improve health outcomes? And then number two, does getting to a specific goal using that therapy lead to improvements in health outcomes? And then number three, is there one class of medication that is better than another class? or does just the simple fact of getting them to goal, is that really what matters? So we'll try to answer these questions. JNC8, or the panel members of JNC8, wanted to be very evidence-based, base their recommendations on high-quality randomized control trials. So to do that, they only looked at randomized control trials from 1966 to the present that included the following. The sample size had to be greater than 100, the follow-up time had to be greater than one year. Primary endpoint data had to include major end organ damage. And patients needed to be greater than 18 years of age or older with hypertension. So they really just wanted to look at the highest quality information. So already we're starting to see some of the differences between JNC7 and JNC8. And this chart kind of mentions some of those com or compares the two. I'd like you to look specifically at the methodology, treatment goals, and the drug therapy. So if you look at methodology, you can see that JNC8 is much more evidence-based. They look only at randomized controlled trials, where JNC7 had a non-systematic literature review by expert committee, including a range of study designs. And they base their recommendations on a consensus of the panel. And then looking at treatment goals, JNC7 had separate treatment goals defined for uncomplicated hypertension and for subsets of various comorbid conditions. JNC8 has similar treatment goals defined for all hypertensive populations, except when the evidence supported different goals for a particular subpopulation. And we'll go over those. And then if you look at drug therapy, JNC7 talks a lot about the compelling indications, and remember that they recommended a thiazide type diuretic for most patients as first line therapy, whereas we'll find out with JNC8 that they really just, they don't really have a particular class of medication that they recommend first line. 
but they recommend choosing from one of four different classes of medications. So the first recommendation of JNC-8 is that it basically states that the gold blood pressure for someone 60 years of age and older would be relaxed to less than 150 over 90. So this is different from JNC-7. JNC-7, if you remember, has a gold blood pressure for almost everybody at less than 140 over 90. So the panel members looked at several high quality randomized controlled trials that showed a benefit at treating to this gold blood pressure of less than 150 over 90. Particularly the JATOS trial compared shooting for a blood pressure of lower than 140 versus a blood pressure between 140 and 160 and found no difference between the two groups. So that's basically where the less than 150 over 90 comes from at patients older than age 60. However, as a side note, the panel members did not want people to adjust their therapy for someone who is not complaining of side effects and who has a blood pressure of less than 140. So basically under GNC7 they were controlled, they're not complaining of side effects, and they're doing pretty well with their therapy. With the JNC-8, they don't want physicians to take away medications just to bring them back to 150 if they're controlled and not having side effects. The second recommendation corresponds with the goal diastolic blood pressure from JNC-7 for the general population. Basically, what you're looking at is if you have a patient younger than age 60, their diastolic blood pressure goal should be less than 90. Of note, if you look at the evidence rankings, there's more evidence in this age group to target diastolic blood pressure compared to the systolic blood pressure. So if you look at for ages 30 through 59, it has a strong recommendation of grade A. When we look at the systolic blood pressure recommendation in the next one, in recommendation number three, pay particular attention to the evidence grade. So some important points about the diastolic blood pressure is this also came from several high quality randomized control trials. In particular, the HOT trial showed no difference between a goal blood pressure of less than 90, less than 85, or less than 80 diastolically. So because of that, for the general population less than age 60, our goal diastolic blood pressure is going to be less than 90. The panel did not find any good high quality randomized control trials for less than 30 years of age. Therefore, that was more of a expert opinion. So recommendation number three has to do deal with the systolic blood pressure. So for patients less than age 60 years of age, it is recommended to treat to a gold blood pressure of less than 140. So if you look at the evidence grade, that's grade E, which is expert opinion. So there weren't very good high quality trials that dealt specifically with systolic blood pressure in this age group. And so they had to resort to expert opinion. So recommendation number four states that in the general population aged 18 years of age and older with chronic kidney disease, their gold blood pressure is going to be the same as the general population. It's going to be less than 140 over 90. This is different from JNC7, because remember JNC7 had a gold blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 for patients with chronic kidney disease. And then recommendation number five is similar to number four, except that it deals with patients with diabetes. So if you remember for JNC7, patients with diabetes had a gold blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. JNC8 failed to find any compelling evidence to support that statement. So therefore, patients with diabetes have the same blood pressure goal as the general population, and they have a goal of less than 140 over 90. So this trial randomized patients that had diabetes and that had a high cardiovascular risk to either receive medication to shoot for a blood pressure goal of less than 120 systolically or a blood pressure goal of less than 140 systolically. At the end of the trial, there was no difference in the combined cardiovascular events and death seen between the two groups. Their primary endpoint, there wasn't a difference between the two groups of treating to less than 120 or the less than 140. 
However, there obviously there was decreased side effects in the less than 140 group because they didn't have to take as high of doses or as many drugs. Also, many people point out that as a secondary outcome, stroke prevention was better in the less than 120 group. However, this was a secondary outcome and the trial overall was not powered sufficiently to make that a strong statement. So the investigators you know, used the ACCORD trial to basically show that treating to a gold blood pressure of less than 140 is about the same as less than 130 and so they relaxed the goal for patients with diabetes to less than 140 over 90. So recommendation number six deals more with drug therapy. So first, in the general non-black population, including those with diabetes, initial drug treatment should include either a thiazide type diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, it's commonly called an ACE inhibitor, or an angiotensin receptor blocker, commonly called an ARB. So this differs from JNC7 in that any one of those medications can be used first line, whereas JNC7 recommended a thiazide type diuretic for most patients. So in reviewing this, let's review the all hat trial again and familiarize ourselves with it. So this was the largest antihypertensive trial to date, and it was great because it was a comparative trial, and it was funded by the National Institutes of Health. The all hat stands for antihypertensive and lipid lowering treatment to prevent heart attack trial. And their main question was, do calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and alpha blockers cause less fatal coronary heart disease and non-fatal heart attacks compared to diuretics? So they randomized over 42,000 patients to receive either amlodipine, lisinopril, doxazosin, or chlorothaladone. So I really like this slide because it shows that after seven years, between those three groups, the chlorothaladone, amlodipine, and lisinopril, there was no difference in the primary outcome of cardiovascular events or non-fatal MI. There was no difference between chlorothaladone, amlodipine, and lisinopril. So you may notice that doxazosin is missing from that group, and the doxazosin arm of the trial was actually stopped prematurely because investigators found that patients taking doxazosin had a higher risk of death and heart failure compared to the other groups, and so that arm was stopped. No difference between any of those three drugs, and so JNC7 advocated the use of thiazide-type diuretics because at the time they were the least expensive agents, and it was one of the agents that we had a long history of using, and so we knew that it was very safe and effective. Now, what has changed since 2002 or since the release of All Hat? Well, now the amlodipine and the lisinopril are both generic also. And so the cost of therapy has decreased significantly, and we have gained 12 years more of experience in using those drugs. Then, if you add in the cost of having to possibly use supplemental potassium with the thiazide type diuretic, and the cost of monitoring your electrolytes and using that. Amlodipine may be the least expensive drug out of the three. I think JNC8 made a good recommendation in saying that we can use any of those drugs. We can use an ACE inhibitor, we can use an ARB, we can use a calcium channel blocker, or we can use a thiazide type diuretic without any issues. So some other important points on that concept is, with the exception of diabetes, this recommendation is not for those patients with other pre-existing diseases or compelling indications, such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, or chronic kidney disease. They also made a big point that we need to titrate to doses used in the randomized controlled trials. And then many patients will still need multiple medications to get to goal, so the argument of which medication is better often is kind of mute because most patients are going to need two to three drugs anyways to get to goal. So this chart shows the target doses 
in the randomized control trials that were reviewed, and so therefore we need to shoot for those. I'll draw your attention to the hydrochlorothiazide. So if you look at the target dose for hydrochlorothiazide, it's actually 25 to 100 milligrams per day. There's probably quite a few patients on 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide, but very few on 50 to 100 milligrams. That's because once you get to those doses, the incidence of hypokalemia and hyperglycemia increases significantly. So most patients are going to stay at 15 or at 12.5 to 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide a day. I'd also like to draw your attention to the number of doses per day. So we try to increase patients' compliance by taking medications just once daily. Also, we want to try to get a good 24-hour blood pressure control. So the longer-acting medications or the medications with longer half-lives would be preferable in these situations. So if we have a patient who's African-American or black, and including those patients with diabetes, JNC-8 says that these patients would benefit more from the use of a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. So this goes back to the statement that ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are less effective in the black population. And so JNC-8 recommends that they receive thiazides or calcium channel blockers. So if we look back at the ALHAT trial, it showed that thiazide diuretics were superior to ACE inhibitors in the black population also showed that there was a 51% higher risk of stroke in black patients taking ACE inhibitors to those taking calcium channel blockers. So this provides evidence to support that statement. If your black patient has diabetes, however, this recommendation is, is weaker. There's not as much evidence to support that. And recommendation 8 has to do with, with those patients that have chronic kidney disease. So basically, if you have chronic kidney disease, then you should have an ACE inhibitor or an ARB as part of your antihypertensive therapy. This applies to all patients with chronic kidney disease, regardless of race. So if you have a black patient with chronic kidney disease, this is the exception to the rule, and they do need an ACE or an ARB as part of their therapy. So the ASK trial showed benefit in black patients with chronic kidney disease taking an ACE inhibitor. Evidence also points to better renal outcomes with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Data showing cardiovascular benefit compared to other drugs, however, is conflicting. And then it's important to monitor serum creatinine and potassium. I still often get asked by patients and providers about the harmful effects of ACE inhibitors or ARBs on the kidneys. And this is why we carefully monitor the serum creatinine. So what is happening, if you remember, is that ACEs and ARBs can dilate the efferent arterial or the artery that takes blood away from the glomerulus in the kidney. To compensate for this and to keep constant pressure on the glomerulus, the body would then need to also dilate the afferent arterial. If, for some reason, for example, the afferent arterial is stenosed, or you're taking a medication that causes constriction of the afferent arterial, then your GFR will drop when you take an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and your serum creatinine will increase. So what we do is we do a baseline serum creatinine to see where your baseline is, and then we'll recheck it in one to three weeks. And if we see a 0.1 to a 0.2 increase on your serum creatinine, we consider that normal. But if we start to see a more significant increase or even a doubling of your serum creatinine, we need to stop the ACE inhibitor or the ARB and do some further testing to avoid any type of acute renal failure. So recommendation number nine just deals with how to adjust therapy to get better control. So the main objective hypertension treatment is to attain and maintain somebody's gold blood pressure. So if the gold blood pressure is not reached within a month of treatment, we need to look at the dose of medication that we used and um, increase it or add a second drug from one of the four classes that we initially recommended. Also, the clinician should continue to assess blood pressure and adjust treatment 
and adjust the treatment regimen until the blood pressure goal is reached. If the goal blood pressure cannot be reached with two drugs, then you need to add and titrate a third drug from those same four classes of medication. The caveat here though is that you should not use an ARB and an ACE inhibitor together. That combination has not shown any benefit but has shown increased side effects. And then if the goal blood pressure cannot still be reached with um, triple therapy, you need to again look at the doses and titrate the doses or then you can start to use other classes of medications such as a beta blocker or a aldosterone antagonist. And then if you're still having trouble, you should probably be referred at this point to a hypertensive specialist and for further guidance because at this point, you know, we've done a lot and maybe there's something else that is being overlooked that the specialist can, can find. So the next two slides is basically an algorithm to follow in treating blood pressure according to JNC8. So we'll start out with an adult aged 18 years and older with hypertension. Always we're going to initiate lifestyle modifications. We're going to look at their diet. We're going to look at their exercise and see if there's some um, specific interventions we can make there. Next, we're going to set their blood pressure goal and initiate blood pressure lowering medications based on their age, their if they have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, and looking at their race. So for the general population with no diabetes or chronic kidney disease, then we'll look at their age. If they're at 60 years of age or older, then their goal blood pressure is going to be less than 150 over 90. If they're less than age 60, then their goal blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. Then also, for all ages, if they have diabetes present, their goal is less than 140 over 90. Or for all ages, if they have chronic kidney disease, their goal blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. So then, if they have diabetes, or if they don't have diabetes, then we would look at their race, see if they're black or non-black. In the non-black population, we can choose either a thiazide type diuretic, an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, or a calcium channel blocker. We can use any of those alone or in combination, um, except we're not going to use an ACE inhibitor and an ARB together. So we'll select the drug treatment and then continue to monitor to see if they're at goal. If they're not at goal, we can use one of three different strategies to get them to goal. We can either maximize the dose, so increase the dose. We can add a second medication before reaching the maximum dose of the first medication, or we can start with two medication classes separately or as a fixed dose combination. Then remember for the black population, we just want to use a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker alone or in combination at first. And then for chronic kidney disease, we want to initiate therapy with either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So again, if they're not at goal blood pressure, we'll continue to either increase dose, the doses or add, it, add on additional medication. And then once we get to the point where they're on triple therapy and they're still not at goal, we would want to then refer them to a hypertensive specialist for further workup. So again, this slide, just shows some of the different therapies that you can choose to get somebody to goal. GNC7 advocated the early use of two medications, whereas GNC8 really leaves it up to the clinician to decide if they're going to start one drug and titrate it, and then start another drug and titrate it, and then start a third drug and titrate it, or if they're going to automatically start with two medications, or maybe they'll start with one medication and before they get to the target dose, they'll add on a second medication. And a lot of this has to do with patient preference and how they do with their medications. So I, I really like the fact that the guidelines give us multiple options as far as what to do once somebody isn't at goal. So going back to our patient, JR, what, what are we going to do? How are you going to treat his blood pressure? Well, this is how I would approach treatment. I would first discontinue the metoprolol because there is not a compelling indication for such such as a history of heart attack or heart failure. He doesn't have any of those. 
hopefully this will help her to exercise better because with the beta blockers you can get some exercise intolerance it's hard to get your heart rate up so if we discontinue that it may help her exercise i would then look at increasing the dose of the ace inhibitor or changing to one that can be dosed once a day for better 24-hour blood pressure control i would then have the patient return in two to four weeks to reevaluate we don't want to make too many changes at one time and then if the blood pressure remains high then I would look at increasing the dose of the hydrochlorothiazide. Then I would reevaluate after another three to four weeks. Then if at this time she is still not at goal, I would look to add the amlodipine. Because of the ACE and the hydrochlorothiazide, in addition to the blood pressure, um, I would monitor the serum creatinine and the electrolytes probably on a, on a yearly basis just to make sure that the potassium and serum creatinine stay under control. So to finish up, I wanted to go over one more trial, and it's called the ACCOMPLISH trial. I think this will help us in determining which combination therapy we should use in treating these patients. So the ACCOMPLISH trial was published in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and its official title is Avoiding Cardiovascular Events Through Combination Therapy in patients living with systolic hypertension. So basically these were high-risk patients and they were randomized to either receive an ACE inhibitor plus a thiazide type diuretic or an ACE inhibitor plus a calcium channel blocker. Specifically they used the benazapril amlodipine versus benazapril and hydrochlorothiazide. And actually what they found is that the patients that took benazapril and amlodipine together had much better outcomes than those that took the benazapril and the hydrochlorothiazide. So you can kind of take away a couple of points from this or ask a few questions. Number one, is hydrochlorothiazide the best thiazide type diuretic to use for hypertension? I know it's the most used and it's used often in patients who need combination therapy. However, when you look at the large trials that show benefit with thiazide type diuretics, most of those used more potent and longer acting chlorthalidone. Next, you can think of, you can think of is, is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker better for combination compared to a thiazide ACE combination? In this, this trial, at least when you use hydrochlorothiazide combined with an ACE inhibitor, the amlodipine, which is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, did much better combined with the ACE also, when you combine an ACE inhibitor with the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, you seem to get rid of some of the negative side effects of the calcium channel blocker, such as the swelling. So this, you know, tends to be a good combination. So let's go over another case. We have BB. He's a 50-year-old patient with a family history of heart disease. He had not been to a physician for over eight years. He does not have any complaints. His blood pressure today measures 164 over 82. So in order to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension, the physician asks BB to come back in three days to recheck his blood pressure. His blood pressure now reads 162 over 84. The physician makes the diagnosis of stage two hypertension. So to evaluate this case, let's look at what JNC8 says to do. So basically we have three treatment choices. He is above goal, we need to get him to goal. So number one, treatment can include monotherapy, titrated up to the maximum dose, and then other medications are added until the blood pressure is at goal. Number two, we can start treatment with monotherapy and then add another drug before the first drug is titrated to the maximum dose. So for example, we could start something like lisinopril, 20 milligrams, and then instead of titrating that up to 40 milligrams, we would add another medication such as um, hydrochlorothiazide or amlodipine to that. Number three, we could just start treatment with dual therapy and then titrate the therapy up. So let's look back a little bit at JNC7 to fill in a few holes. So JNC8 does not mention anything about blood pressure levels at which hypertension is diagnosed. And so we still revert back to JNC7 for diagnosis, which means that stage one hypertension is from a blood pressure of 140 over 90 to 159 over 99. 
and stage 2 hypertension is anything above 160 over 100. So since this patient's systolic blood pressure is above 160, he would be diagnosed with stage 2 hypertension. Also, JNC7 says that patients with stage 2 hypertension should be started on two medications. This is because most patients that are more than 20 points systolically away from their goal or 10 points diastolically away from their goal are probably going to end up needing two medications to get them to goal. And then JNC7 says that one of the drugs in the combination should be a thiazide type diuretic. And so we've talked about that. We've talked about how all three medications that are recommended in JNC8, the thiazide, the ACE, and the calcium channel blocker were similar in the all-hat trial, and now all of them are very inexpensive, and so really any of them could be used now. However, we, now, we do have the addition of the accomplished trial, which showed that the combination of venazepril with amlodipine was better than the benazepril hydrochlorothiazide com combination. So that might be something to consider. So in treating BB, the gold blood pressure is less than 140 over 90 per JNC8. Drug therapy options include a thiazide type diuretic, an ACE inhibitor, or a calcium channel blocker, either alone or in combination. And then according to the accomplished trial, the ACE calcium channel blocker combination would be better and an ACE thiazide combination. However, another option would be either the ACE inhibitor or the calcium channel blocker combined with chlorthalidone, because remember, chlorthalidone is longer acting and more potent, and maybe the accomplished trial would have had different results if they used chlorthalidone instead of hydrochlorothiazide. So, in my opinion, I would recommend starting this patient on lisinopril 10 milligrams daily along with amlodipine, five milligrams daily. So just throwing in there, what if BB was an African-American? Remember JNC8 specifically says that ACE inhibitors are not first line in this population. So most likely if BB was African-American, we would recommend a combination of amlodipine, which is the calcium channel blocker, combined with a thiazide type diuretic such as chlorthalidone in order to treat the patient. So with that, that's JNC8. Just to review a couple of the key points for um, the general population, the gold blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. If you're 60 years of age and older and don't have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, your gold blood pressure is going to be less than 150 over 90. For treatment, we can start out using any one of either an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, a thiazide type diuretic, or a calcium channel blocker. Also, if you are black, then you should start treatment with either a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. If you have chronic kidney disease, your initial treatment should be with a, either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And then, the gold blood pressure for patients with diabetes or chronic kidney disease is still just less than 140 over 90. We don't need to be more aggressive with these patients and get them down to less than 130 over 80. The evidence just doesn't support that.